Hello and welcome to everybody. It is a great pleasure to welcome everybody to this amazing panel event and expert seminar series on AI and ML for business. Um, as you know, at Berkeley, we are not only world leading in research, but also in academic innovation. And we are very proud and very happy to be able to um, launch this amazing expert seminar series um, today with this incredible panel event. What we are offering you here is access to the latest know-how and best practices from really outstanding global thought leaders delivered in a very unique format, combining a panel with three seminars that really are targeted at empowering you to take critical strategic decisions in your own work in your own organizations to boost your own careers. We're very, very honored and very thankful to our panelists and speakers that have taken the time to share their unique expertise and insights with you uh, through this panel and this expert seminar series. And we are very thankful to our lead expert, Gauthier, for having helped put all of this together and bring everyone together to share their expertise. Thank you so much, Gauthier. Please take it away and kick us off into this amazing panel. So once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Uh, I know we have a global audience today, so it's, um, it really feels good to, uh, to put together a panel when there's so many people listening in, paying attention. So um, for us, it's, um, it's going to be a, a great hour. So this panel, Navigating the Pitfalls and the Opportunities of AI and ML, is gonna be supported by three great individuals. We have Sarah Ernie, Senior Director, Machine Learning and Engineering at Salesforce. We have Dan Felt, Head of uh, Global Enterprise Business Hardware Partnerships at Google. And we have Robert Brown, Vice President and uh, at the Center of Future of Work at Cognizant. And by the way, uh, Rob and Cognizant are also a partner and sponsor of this panel and this whole series. We've been working together for many years and they are great supporters of the work we do at Berkeley in general and at the Fisher Center for Business Analytics in particular. So on behalf of the center, on behalf of Berkeley Global, on behalf of Berkeley, thank you guys for joining me on that panel. These three instructors who are going to lead the videos you will subscribe to and listen to are here today to give you a little bit of taste, preview of what they're going to share. And the whole topic that we will cover, I mean, partly today, but mostly in the upcoming videos is all about business, artificial intelligence and machine learning. Because after many years of buzz and mirages that we've all been chasing, I think it's high time we stopped and think about how can we, we, make it, can we make it work for us? How can we apply it to business to just to do better business or to do a better world? And that's how we articulated these series to empower you to understand one, what is really that AI and ML that everybody talks about and how does it work in the real life? And that's gonna be Dan talking about it. Second is where do we fit as human being as AI become smarter and stronger and faster? Where is the value we can all bring to the table? And there is a lot. And that session will be hosted by Sarah Ernie. And last but not least, we'll finish by taking a look at what the future holds. Because a lot is going to progress, a lot is going to evolve, and we need to find our way. We need to find our bearing. And this is where we have an amazing session from Robert Brown about the future of works, the where, the what, the how it's all going to unfold. But for today, well, I have told you we're going to get a preview of all this. For today, I want, you to, to, I want you to feel like, oh, I want to take these videos. But, before, uh, but above that, I, really, I hope that the four of us 
we give you that appetite to learn more, that confidence that, yes, you can do it, and that eagerness to learn, to hop on that learning journey that will take you to understand a bit more of business analytics and a bit more of AI and ML. Just give you that, what we call at Berkeley, that student always attitude. And hopefully that webinar today, that panel will be one of your first steps on that learning path. So as we said, feel free to ask questions on the q and I'll be monitoring them as we go. And without further ado, let's start with our great panelists. So Sarah, Robert, Dan, welcome. And let me first start with a simple question, because I hear so many versions of that. But all of you, take your pick. Choose who wants to start. What is your definition of AI or machine learning? How do you view that? I, I, I guess I'll, I'll go first. Uh, this is Rob. Thank you so much, Gautier. I appreciate the, the introduction. Uh, again, Rob Brown, Cognizant Center for the Future of Work. Uh, also a proud uh, Cal grad. So go Bears. Good to be uh, associated with the Berkeley Global event uh, today. Uh, so I've been a member of the, the Cognizant Center for the Future of Work for about seven years now. And prior to, to that, uh, I was managing vice president of research at Gartner for about 15 years. So it always looked at technology, looked at technology specifically applied to business processes. And so uh, when I think about artificial intelligence, uh, there, there's, there's two ways to think about it. One is, you know, a lot of people talk about uh, ANI, so um, uh, narrow intelligence. And so that's very specific applications of AI uh, to business uh, uh, processes, to customer experiences, and so forth. And that's the preponderance of what we're seeing uh, today. The second is, is general intelligence. And so when we think about some of the new cutting edge uh, application of, of AI engines um, like GPT-3, I'm sure we'll talk a little bit about that as we go through, uh, that really falls into that category. And then there's sort of super intelligence, which is, you know, AI terminators running amok, sort of in the popular imagination. That's really Hollywood's plot line. I think where the action is at for most businesses and, you know, for people that are going into the field, it's, it's machine learning. And so if you think about AI and sort of all the tropes associated with that, where the action is going to be is in machine learning. Lots of it applied to lots and lots of problems for humanity, problems for businesses, and problems for uh, each of us individually. And that brings opportunities too. Excellent. So um, how about you? How about you, Sarah? I mean, you might also want to understand what you do at Salesforce and give us your view of what AI and ML should mean to us. Absolutely. Uh, yes. Yeah, so I run a few of the automated machine learning teams here at Salesforce that deliver AI into the hands of our customers so that they can leverage it in the way that best helps them do their jobs in the context of a, a customer relationship management platform that we offer. Um, so really for me, over the years of working in the space of AI, all the way back to grad school, when it was really focused around research and the biomedical domain, and now today where it's really about democratizing it and putting it into the hands of customers. When I think of AI, it's really about having machines kind of think like humans, teach them how to make things easier for us. That's provide context to a situation where I'm having an interaction, automating things that are very tedious where we can then have the human really up level what they should be doing that's new and different on top of that to make it even better, even, even more intelligent interaction. Um, and then allow them to, to do more, to make everything smarter, to make the experience better. And absolutely, um, like Rob said, there's, there's kind of the area of, uh, machine learning, and we also think of deep learning as sort of a portion of that as well, where it's the application of it to structured data, image data, uh, text and voice, like how is it that in every context that we have access to data, we can augment that experience and allow that human who's in the loop, who's doing their job day to day, just be superhuman in that experience. Very nice. Superhuman. So how about you, Dan? What, what's your role at, at Google and how do you see AI and ML? Thank you, Gutierrez, and thank you very much for the great introduction. Um, at, uh, at this point at Google, I focus at our mobility platform, uh, both in, uh, with the Pixel uh, phones and the Android Enterprise platform and how uh, large enterprises are utilizing it. And um, 
if I'm thinking about my, my career so far, I've been in the technological focus for many, uh, many years uh, in CIO positions and a lot about databases and, and data-driven systems. And uh, later on with cloud system and, and machine learning systems, I'm thinking about everything that was said so far and what can I complement uh, uh, to these uh, words. And I'm thinking that AI for me is a business opportunity to scale. And if I may say so in brackets, maybe even a personal opportunity for all of us to scale. If you're looking at everything that we've done so far in Gutierrez, and, and I are talking about this in the, in the seminar itself, everything that we've done with databases and with data-driven system in businesses were fragments of systems, fragments of values. And you needed so much understanding of the process and understanding of technology, each technology separately to really make sense of it. And you know, even if we're successful in doing so, the precious time in focusing in our customers is being taken into focusing in, in the fragments of technology. So I think that, and we'll talk about it hopefully some more in the next hour, AI gives us the opportunity to scale all of it and to connect the dots and have a much more coherent process that can adhere to the business process. That's excellent. And for our audience, you now have like several vectors to look at these strange acronyms. And that, that's how I love to, to, to see it. There's probably not one definition that fits all. You got to understand it from all these angles and also from this practicality. Because what at, at the end of the day, why it matters is what it's going to do for us. And hence, my second question to the panel is, um, you know, we've all seen a lot of these buzzy projects that didn't yield that much in the end. They were surely sparkly, shiny. Um, are there any concrete projects or applications you see today at your clients, at your partners, where you say, yep, this is happening now. This has value. This is not a fluke. This is not going to go away. Any concrete example for our audience? I can uh, start. Um, and I want to take uh, perhaps on, on Rob's, Rob's point uh, early on about machine learning. Um, and uh, Sarah was mentioning it as well. If we think about machine learning and we think about the practicality of what we can do today, I'm, I, I can't agree more. I think that vertical specific solutions that can help us solve problems or get insights uh, to processes are a lot about the name of the game today. And let me give you just a simple, simple example. If I would like to use machine learning to identify uh, what if there is uh, a certain object in a picture, I can build complex machine learning systems or even deep learning, I can train algorithms. I, I can do a lot of things and get the perfect result to what I need. Or I can, I can find out that today in the cloud business, there are specific services, high level services that can give me either exactly what I want or 80% of what I need. And I think it goes back to, um, and we'll talk about it some more, to uh, business leaders that needs to be aware and more aware about technology because some of the, the decisions that we need to do is to be in the room, to talk about technology and to mix it with the customer focus, to mix it with what, how much time it makes sense to spend on a technology that is being used to build our products. And vertical solutions that are available today as cloud, as cloud services. Uh, that if I'll, I'll go, uh, I'll continue my example, just I can send a picture to the cloud and get a result. Um, uh, using an already trained model and, and cloud systems. Um, it's just a one example of the availability of specific solutions and they need, they need for business leaders to understand the meaning of the problem, the, 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 the uh, various type of solutions and make sure that we as a company are focused in using the right, uh, uh, the right solutions with the right priorities. And that's what I think is, is exciting today. The availability of solutions and the ability of business leaders to be part of making these decisions, even if it's a technological term. I love the way you phrase it. For leaders, even if it's a technological term. And I think uh, 
I agree with you. Uh, leaders need to get their hands into a bit of technology today. It's, it's no matter of whether you got to do it or not. It's, it's a matter of when you have to do it and when it's probably now. I agree. I would, I would just piggyback if I could on, on Dan's great point about, you know, examples talking about, about the application of, you know, just, just imaging uh, to, to businesses and enterprise, you know, I just completed an entire uh, uh, think piece on the future of media and entertainment. That's a huge applicability. But if we think about society, uh, and as we record this, uh, yesterday was Earth Day. And I think that one of the, one of the absolutely most fascinating examples that I've seen the last several years on uh, use of, of AI uh, uh, facial recognition software, which we kind of think, you know, societally, at least in, in the West, you know, it's a little bit spooky, Orwellian. Um, and, and that is a, that is a, a, a thorny issue. We got to, we're going to talk about ethics, I know, in, 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 a, in a bit, Gautier. But where I'm going with this is uh, the Nature Conservancy actually transposed facial recognition software uh, called it fish face. It was for use on ocean going fleets uh, for, you know, when, when uh, there's uh, commercial fishing fleets are catching, you know, a lot of bycatch and you actually have to say, well, how many of these endangered species did we actually pull up in the net? Fish face actually allows them uh, to do that. And so I think as we think about ecology, we think about the world's oceans, some of you, you know, may have seen, you know, Sea Spiracy, the, the new documentary. That's a very, very cool application of, of AI and facial recognition technology uh, that is sort of separate from other, the other thorny things that we need to think about societally with, with people. Um, and then for, for anybody, uh, you know, so, sort of followed along the, uh, the development of, uh, of AlphaGo, and there was, again, great Netflix documentary about, you know, Lee Seedall, human Go master, was absolutely destroyed by, uh, by AlphaGo from DeepMind. Um, the transposition of that technology to AlphaFold to help scientists get to massive scale protein folding as an on-ramp to solving pre-onset uh, dementia uh, and Alzheimer's, that is an absolutely super cool good news story. There's a lot of other thorny stuff that we need to talk about in terms of some of the downsides of leading edge AI and ML, but those are a couple of the ones that I think are really cool and worth watching. Indeed. How about you, Sarah? What did you witness lately? For us, it's actually very interesting. At Salesforce, we are putting AI in the hands of our customers to use it in the context that makes sense for them. And I think what's fascinating about that is it's beyond what I could really imagine. What we're doing is taking the business experts, the people that really understand the challenges that they're seeing, and again, the opportunities where AI can come in and solve it. And we repeatedly see, uh, for example, Recommendation Builder, which is this ability to recommend things to things. How do you actually allow a customer to recommend products to a sale or um, you know, we have other examples where it's used uh, even around optimizing a service interaction. And it's really, for me, impossible to think about how we could address this at scale uh, by hiring data scientists in every organization, building up the infrastructure required, or even finding the right tools that exist out there and leverage them building up that expertise, working that muscle. And so really figuring out how to put it in the hands of the customers and offering it to them in the context that makes sense for us at Salesforce, and then just making it about that experience about imagining the art of the possible. So it's, it's very difficult for me to actually pinpoint, you know, these are the coolest examples because our customers are showing us that if they're given the right tools, they are actually able to apply it in the right domain. And um, yeah, the, the creativity is amazing. And it's the, where data scientists could never absorb that level of expertise, of course, that is the business expert. Flip side as an engineer could never think about how to you know, solve all these problems as well. And then the business itself, which yes, they need to understand, they need to learn, but in a way where they're thinking, what's the metric I'm moving and how can AI and the tools that are offered to me make it easier to move that metric in the direction that is making it easier for my customers to have that experience, making it easier for my employees to actually do their jobs and, and do it well and have that positive feedback. You know, just listening to your first three answers, and it's just the beginning of the panel, I must, I must tell to the audience that uh, I, I was there when uh, we prepared the videos, the classes, the master series for you guys. Um, just listening to you again on this panel makes me want to go back to these videos. And um, there's so much uh, you illustrated already from your answer. That's such a great teaser for these, uh, these videos. So... Uh, at this stage, I'd love to take a few uh, questions from uh, the audience already. We have quite a lot. Short answer, 
is AI overhyped or underhyped or just right at the, uh, at the level it should be today? I'll move this away from the hype conversation. <laughs> we know that there's a spectrum of um, maybe maturity with where people are at in terms of even having access to the platform, the tools that make it possible to iterate in production. Um, I, in, in my point of view, it's certainly when you look across the, the industry, maybe under leveraged where we don't have an, enough access to the tools needed in every context that's required. Um, I, I think there is always this discussion about hype cycle and trough of disillusionment. Um, there are tons of publications out there that really talk about where companies believe that they are in terms of adoption and specifically in terms of getting value. So I think I'm, I'm just always hopeful that we start shifting the conversation, maybe not about hype or about uh, the other side, which is like, what's the specific algorithms and models that you're working on, but really shifting toward the value. How much value have we gotten out of AI in the particular context that we need it? And so from that standpoint, I feel like that's the opportunity to have the question around, like, are we getting all the value that we can out of this technology today as it stands? You know, I would just I, I would just add on to uh, to those great comments, Sarah. We um, in our team uh, just completed a data set of 4,000 uh, interviews globally with um, uh, people out or near the C-suite of their businesses, so very large businesses, um, medium businesses, and small businesses. And uh, it was quite interesting that 70% uh, of those 4,000 worldwide um, had some level of implementation of AI uh, in their business processes. And you can imagine sort of the distribution of that. So, you know, sort of the minority of them were deep, you know, full production, some were further along in their parlance and so, some were just beginning uh, that journey. Uh, but in the main, we asked them, you know, what are the top things, what are the top benefits that you're getting out of these initiatives for artificial intelligence? And the top two uh, for 2020, and this data was collected right in the, you know, in the maelstrom of the global pandemic, we were getting operational efficiency and decision-making were the top two. And as we asked them, well, what do you think it's going to be by 2023? Uh, so again, sort of, you know, future of work uh, further out there, those maintain that it would still be operational efficiency and decision making, uh, but almost like a 10 percentage uh, point uh, more intensity in terms of the value of those things. And then you get into other things like customer experience and risks of security and compliance management and so forth. But I think that that efficiency and, you know, Dan, I think you put this well, like how do we use AI as sort of, you know, our co-pilot as humans, how do we get to good decision-making? And Sarah, to your point, whether it's customer interactions, but increasingly we're seeing this distribution in employee experience, suppliers, partners, and sort of the so-called, you know, the hierarchy of distributed people that we all will have to interact with as business leaders, policy leaders to get, you know, the future of our work and the future of these technologies instituted. So that data is telling, I think, a, a pretty important tale about, you know, separating the hype from the reality of what's happening on the ground. Very much agree. Perhaps I can just add a little bit of, uh, of co historical context uh, and, uh, and why it's hyped and why I wouldn't worry about this uh, at all. You know, the, the era and AI is a great example of it that we are in today is a result of many, many ecosystem development and involvement that happened in the last 20 years. Uh, I can name some, for example, open software uh, from something that was used uh, because you didn't have the money to buy commercial software to something that runs the world, literally, um, and to the fact that open source can enable each one of us to learn a, coding and data science and AI on a Raspberry Pi that costs $35 or to run mega servers uh, that empower uh, very large internet companies. And, and it's the same uh, thing. Um, and you know, the, if, if you look at the history, at every given time, something was king. A mainframe was king. Everybody needs to connect to one computer. And then desktop was king. And then cloud uh, can, can do everything, including coffee. Uh, and now AI can do everything, but really think that the power of AI is the power of a lot of things maturing uh, into tools that enables us uh, uh, to do, uh, to focus more on business and, and on our customers and, and our added value as building our product and less in the technicalities um, within this data driven world. Um, and I think that's. Uh, that's why. That, that's how I would I would uh, take into account everything that Sarah and Rob just said. There, there is a question actually from the audience that is quite timely here. Is um, uh, 
um, how, do you, how do you see you can make good usage of a machine learning and AI, get value out of it, if you don't have access to high-end computing? I mean, is that still a barrier to actually start doing stuff in AI? I can maybe start uh, this. Um, I think that um, just to continue what I said, I think that um, we live in the just in the best time ever in history to have access to everything. Um, I gave the Raspberry Pi example, um, and you know it's all hi hiding under huge big words. For example, edge computing, right? But uh, and and that is connected to AI edge co computing and and the huge uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks that, that can do that analysis, but it's all tools that are available to all of us. And it's all tools that can be, be used with basic uh, concepts of data, of understanding what is, are, are the, not only what the answers that we want from the data, but what are the questions that we need to ask. These are the insights that we need to ask ourselves how we do this, which tools are we doing this? We live in the era that everything is available, available for free in high quality. We just need to dig into, into these things. There is really no other uh, reasons or excuses not to do it. I, I think you hit the nail on the head, Dan. You know, I think the question was, was you know, access to technologies. I would argue, you know, uh, it's access to data. It's data, right? And data is, you know, really it's the, the it's it's what comes out of the technology. But you know, is is the data clean, believable, real time? Uh, can can you trust it? What are the sources uh, where that data is coming from? And again, going back to our data set on four thousand respondents, the, it was the AI capabilities plus the data capabilities that were neck and neck. So when we think about skills for the future of work, it's yeah, you know, electrical engineering, computer science, but also data science. And there's precious few data scientists today out there. And that also then bespeaks, how are you building the modern data stack for tomorrow? So I think there's a certain generation of practitioners today that are thinking about uh, next generation you know, data lakes. But again, if the data is not clean, believable, real time integrated, the data lake is like a data cesspool. And so you got to refine that data. And then people that are maybe of a, an older school are thinking about like re relational database management systems. And how do I kind of come into that new uh, understanding of not just the modern data stack, but then you're leveraging things like, like um, cloud modernization to get to all that data. So again, it's back to Gautier to that question. Yeah, the technology is important, but but it's accruing through AI to an understanding of data and making meaning of that data. To the point that comes up a lot in my talk or the, the seminar, uh, for me, I think there's just been an evolution where we focus heavily on the technology and what needs to be in place. And I know as a data scientist and then kind of moving into this more management role, thinking about what's required in order to move it forward, it's, it's huge. Um, we need to have these pipelines in place. We need to have applications. We need to be thinking about that complete experience uh, very much around why we're doing this. How do we measure the impact that it's having on the business? We're trying to improve efficiency, like we mentioned earlier. How do we measure efficiency and then prove that the implementation of a model and putting it into production in an experience where it can actually be consumed is appropriate. And so for me, I think in my session, I certainly talk about what I believe is the foundation that is required and how at Salesforce, of course, we've eliminated that as much as possible. So you don't even have to think about it. It's just built in and available to you. But I think everyone can really benefit from looking at how AI is applied and thinking about how it could be used in, in the right, in situ in the right place, saying that will drive an impact. And, starting from there. How will I measure the impact? How will I then implement it in a way that you actually do consume those models, measure that change, and that can prepare you for when that technology is available to you? Excellent. That's, uh, so you guys, that's also a lot of different ways to look at, at this issue. I hope that was enriching. So moving on to maybe a couple more questions from the audience, because we, we have a lot coming in and I think they fit right in. Um, one is about um, uh, how, how do you start um, today to, to, to start doing some AI and ML and uh, you know, at least to apply that to your business. So we, that would be the last question from the audience because we start today and then I would love to take it to how does the future look like so that we know how to start correctly. But first, what do we need to do today? 
I think it depends on where you're tackling it from. Um, I think, again, in my session, I talk a lot what I believe are the foundations of putting AI into production. I talk about like the mindset that I think we all came from, which is just centralized data, then just bring in a person who understands data, and then magically we will have AI in production. And that was a fallacy that I bought into from the beginning, because it's very, very disconnected from the reality of what it really takes in terms of you know, a platform that allows experimentation to take place, a way to iterate, a way to put it actually into production. Having a model on your laptop is very far removed from having it in production where it's consumed and driving any sort of outcome, driving an action, helping someone understand in context, what, 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 what am I missing? What else should I know? So I think um, probably not useful except to say, maybe if you watch the session, there's a little bit more around what I think some of the foundations are and definitely bringing everyone together to the same table, hyper collaborative mode where you have the business, the engineering, the infrastructure, the data science, or again, just these tools that where it's been built and you can think through it that way. Yeah, and actually you're, you have a guest in this session, which is uh, who is Tandir Shah from uh, Genentech Finance, he's a data scientist over there. And at some point he identifies himself as a AI sales rep, because most of his job is about putting people around the table and get to understand and mentor and help and coach. You know, that's the majority of his work today. Rob and Dan, any um, starting start pointers? Starting I pointers? just just to, to echo a shameless plug from for my lecture. Um, my uh, my guest is one of our clients uh, yeah. from PepsiCo, uh, Martha Roos, and Martha talks about the application of technologies to build the perfect Cheeto. Uh, for those of you that like snack foods, like I do, uh, it'll be interesting. But <laughs> in all seriousness, one of the, the lessons learned that Martha talks about is, you know, all of this sort of a hackneyed phrase in Silicon Valley, but it's true, you know, be prepared to fail fast. And Sarah, you know, to your point, hey, if, if it's not working, you know, let, let's let, you know, sense and respond. What have we learned and how can we apply it to the, to the next thing? And then once you sort of do get that success, how do you scale, scale it out into production? And, you know, whether you're <laughs> building the perfect Cheeto or uh, optimizing and communications or uh, you know building things like cyber, cyber defense for your organization that's the place to start and perhaps i'll i'll um i'll do a shameless uh, promotion to uh my session as well i think it's super aligned with what sarah and rob uh, just said um i'm uh, i'm speaking to a professor michelle ben basat he was um he, he was one of the pioneers of ai uh, many years ago in in the uh, out of Israeli academy in, in the US. And then he was entrepreneur of uh, many companies that were based on AI before it was so cool. And I think that one of the things we're talking about is how do you think about this? How do you apply it in real life? And his point, or a couple of points that I want to bring here is one, sometimes you just need a spreadsheet. So sometimes that's it. <laughs> uh, we don't need to push uh, it where it doesn't belong. And I think we all, we all feel this uh, every day. But when you do need this, do not be ashamed to understand that an implementation and most of the implementations today, and Rob uh, was talking about this in his opening comment, is narrow AI, mm -hmm. is where you identify where you really need it and you apply a very focused solution. In, and to Sarah's point, you learn from there. You see what's the result in production you see how, how it, it benefits you and you scale from there. Yeah. Just being practical about it. And see, that's to the audience. You know, now, now you guys, you realize why I was like a kid in a candy store listening not only to our panelists, but also to the guest speakers. This, is, this, this was just fabulous content. You, you, can't get any, you can't get anywhere else. So I'd love, to, I'd love to change the switch gear here. We talked a lot about, you know, AI in the past, AI today. I'd love to see... How do you see AI and machine learning shaping up tomorrow's world so that we can better get ready? And I think the best person here today to talk about it is uh, Rob and the Center for the Future of Work. Give us a few directions that we should ready ourselves for. Thank, thanks, Gautier. And I think um, you know we've talked a lot about the technology um, and, and data. Uh, so when it comes to work and how we prepare, we need to put people back into the equation. And so this is our relationship, pe people, machines and and one of the ways that we think about um this applied to work is that um 
uh, we humans are really good at what we call um, the, the art of the job. So judgment, ethics, basically being able to answer what's the right thing to do uh, in any context. Um, machines are really good at the science of the job. So um, uh, we talked about the power of algorithms, right? Heavy computation, uh, quantif quantifiable factoring, basically being able to answer the question, what's the next best action, right? Next best action. And so when you put the art of the job and the science of the job together, people and machines, really amazing outcomes can, can occur. And so any job is really the agglomeration of a sum of its tasks. If you're, you know, a a doctor or you're a teacher or you're a banker, uh, you're an analyst like me, uh, law enforcement, even a CEO, it's ba ba made up of tasks. And so if we think about which of those tasks can sort to sort of doubling down on machine application for those jobs and which ones can uh, apply to the human, really cool things can happen. Like 15 years ago, we would talk about, hey, the most, you know, if I told you in 2021, the most in-demand role in the modern marketing function would be the Twitter data wrangler, i.e. social media manager, you would have look, looked at me like I was nuts because Twitter, you know, didn't really exist back then, but here we are. And so in our work at the center, we've um, actually undertaken a, a number of projects looking at what we call 21 jobs of the future, imagining, you know, in the year 2030, what does the job description for a quantum machine learning analyst look like? Something that's very technology he uh, heavy, but then sort of uh, further down we, uh, a, a pyramid of sorts, there's a lot of focus now on purpose in work. So what does the role in a modern HR department of 2030 that maybe involves a chief purpose planner, what does that job look like? And how does that use technology to, uh, to help uh, that individual do his, his or her job? And so there's a whole raft of jobs that we've talked about. And then I would just kind of close this out by saying the importance of place. You know, we've come out of a year now of pandemic and you're seeing the headlines every single day. Is X the new Silicon Valley? Is Austin the new Boston? And so forth. And so jobs of the future are going to happen in places of the future. And AI is the catalyst for this. And, you know, Dan, you kind of kind of touched on, uh, you know, your uh, uh, guest panelist. Um, we just published a, a piece called 21 Places of the Future. And one of the places we talk about is Silicon Wadi, which is, you know, shorthand for Tel Aviv in Israel, because one of the jobs of the future is, is cybersecurity is going to be critical in this world suffused with AI. You know, we're moving from a services economy to an experience economy. You're seeing the experience economy burgeoning in places like Wellington, New Zealand. You're seeing it happening in places like Dundee, Scotland, that are far outside the orbit of sort of the typical uh, mindset of uh, where you know, the future of work happens here in Silicon Valley. So that relationship of place the relationship of future of work and absolutely undergirded by tech centricity in these jobs, I think is important to look at. And there's a whole lot of specifics we can go into tactics. How do you do that as an individual and have agency? Uh, and again, shameless plug, uh, please attend my lecture because we do go into some of that as well. Yeah, no shame here. It's really uh, a lot to learn indeed. Guys, I mean, Sarah and Dan, how, how do you see um, um, you know, the, your work or the people, the, the, the work of the people you work with, your clients, how, you, how do you see that being impacted today? Like in sales, for instance. In, in our experience with, with Salesforce, again, as I mentioned earlier, it's just the breadth of the number of ways that we see it, AI being leveraged is uh, pretty incredible. And I think as we're moving forward, uh, it goes back to this, this notion of democratization where the way that we're going to be doing our jobs um, in order to keep up, in order to be actually uh, delivering that excellent experience, whether it's in sales, whether it's in customer service, you know, marketing, making sure that we, we have the right context in every interaction, it will inevitably require us to work with the data that we have and, and really think through that business experience that you're wanting, that customer centricity that you're wanting to offer. I mean, today there's almost this expectation that our interactions are intelligent. I mean, down to like when we use our phones, when something goes wrong. Just earlier today, when I sent Gautier a message and I used speech to text, and I was so frustrated with, you know, the typo on his name. And to you, it's almost like unimaginable. Well, you have the context, you know who I'm, you know, chatting with. Why was that not there to improve even that interaction? But it's also when you call up a customer service center to not need to have that full context. And also for the folks that are really on the other side, trying to deliver that experience with excellence to make sure that they have all of those tools. It is necessary for them to 
have that context surface to them that's relevant, that they can solve that case quickly and efficiently to actually have, you know, imagine needing to read through so much history in order to capture what's happening with that interaction versus having the relevant piece of surface to you so that you can solve that well, so that, you know, the knowledge articles are available to you that are relevant. And I think this is why it's, it's really about putting those tools into the hands of those business experts so that they can move us forward in that experience with customers, in that experience with our employees and our workplaces everywhere. It is really permeating throughout our lives. And again, in ways where we don't even think twice about it. And would that be safe to say that uh, it's a bit of a paradox, but all, all this trend is going to make our humanity, our experience, our expertise, and even our intuitions just bloom because all of a sudden we're going to have a much better understanding of what's around us and much more time to actually take care of what matters? I mean, I certainly hope just the way that we've seen you know, the evolution with you know, text processing, and we look back around like being able to type something or, or, you know, like access to the internet and information. I think it's hard to sometimes imagine how we will be able to open up the opportunities and improve our experiences. And again, it just goes back to if you democratize, it's, it's the adjacent possible that we see now. But if you look very far forward, it's hard to really anticipate how creativity and really driving around value will move us forward when the tools are put in the hands of the business experts that know what to do. Excellent. Yeah. And anything on you, Dan? Any? Uh... I thought that was uh, an incredible um, overview of, of of that. So perhaps I can just supplement it with the with the with uh, mentioning mobile or mobility. So one thing that we've seen in the last few years, but definitely the COVID uh, year or more than a year now, uh, pushed very strongly across different parts of the market and the global market that were less potentially um, technology advanced is the fact that uh, mobile is really king and mobile is king in the enterprise as well. So that, that means a lot to any data-driven or AI uh, processes uh, or machine learning because uh, it's not enough just to have backend systems that, does, that do something and you... Uh, and it's not enough to assume that somebody sits in an office and has a constant connection to the internet and to servers and to everything needed. Now you have mobile and, and you have IoT devices and uh, maybe they are connected, maybe they are not connected for a while and maybe they are poorly connected. But yet the other end, to Sarah's great points, needs answers and support and, and, and of, of whatever they're doing in the field from sales to, to customer and technical services. So now it's not enough to, uh, to, to, to assume that you can get the data and digest it. You need to think how you're going to get it. And because you cannot simply get everything, you need to think about priorities and be smart about what's important. Uh, how do I understand what's important to get from the field? How I understand what's important to reply to the field, and and uh, and how do I complete the rest of the process in the back end when when things are less uh, pressure, and that is um, uh, a huge opportunity, but so many layers for all of us to uh, to understand and to uh, to focus at. Uh, it's no longer just we have data, let's do something with it. Um, and I think, Dan, that's a, gr a great point. And I, I was thinking about um, just the application of every process. This is the power of digital transformation and AI in every process, front, middle, and back office processes. And for most large Fortune 500 companies, they've grown through merger and acquisition over years. And so there's just this layering on this kludge of legacy sort of, you know, technical debt ridden systems. And for the, you know, the digital native companies out there, they sort of born digital. And so they didn't have that, that integration problem. And I was actually thinking about, you know, again, people of a certain age, like myself, I was just reading an article about the first um, uh, uh, spreadsheets. And so when VisiCalc came along, you know, way back in the midst of time, it was like a revelation that if I change this cell in, you know, Excel, it will automatically update all other versions. Whereas previously it's like, well, that one changed. So we got to just manually go in and change all these other cells. And so Sarah, your point about, you know, when you're doing uh, uh, speech or text recognition and it, and it registers exactly the intent, 
that's a really cool discipline. And so now we're moving from a world where, you know, our interface and computing was our thumbs, our fingers to the voice. And so suddenly we think about future of work, things like voice UX designers now are in super high demand. Um, you know, 10 years ago, if you said, hey, you're coming out of Cal Berkeley with a linguistics degree, good luck with that. It's Google Translate's world. Now, with the nuances, the subtleties of dialect and vernacular for potentially a market of 7 billion people on the planet, that's really exciting with the voice as the, the interface to, to, um, to the machine. So um, all of this sort of layering and how you break through those legacy processes, sometimes it's just, a, it's just it's super expensive and you've got to cut through that. And so that's one of the frontiers too, is how do we deal with our process debt? You know, Rob, you cracked me up. I would venture to say that 80% of our audience today does even, doesn't even know or never heard the term VisiCalc ever. I had totally forgotten it. I had totally forgotten it too. I read this article and I was like, I, I think I was in high school. I remember that was kind of a breakthrough. So there's actually a, a curable question on the, um, on, on the, on the Q&A. It's uh, um, about, you know, we talked about a lot of business supply AI, you know, kind of monetizing this value of AI. But isn't that um, twisting a little bit that field to make it too business driven, too money driven, too profit driven? Any take on that? Very open ended question. I mean, in a word, the answer is is a qualified yes, maybe more than than a qualified yes. This gets into public policy and it gets into geopolitics as well. So, you know, one of the things that we've certainly been looking a lot lot at is uh, just the approach of um, the different regions. Obviously, G Europe, we're two, what, two, three years on from the, the, the um, advent of GDPR in terms of our relationship with our personal data and digital uh, platforms. You know, here in the United States, really driven out of California, it's the wild west of data and heaven help anybody that gets in the way of monetizing that. Um, but we're getting there. Uh, and then, of course, China is doing its thing, right? So sort of mass sur surveillance, surveillance all the time. Uh, and so I think our relationship with, with data and, and today just driven by big tech, typically Silicon Valley, yes, it is an issue. Uh, and it goes back, I think, simplistically stated trust. Right? The absence of trust will lead to antitrust. You're hearing it in Washington, D.C. a lot these days. And so as we think about this outside of the realm of corporate application of technology and how we relate to things like edge devices, IoT, AI, uh, the use of algorithms, this is a big societal uh, issue and something that we all have a stake in. And so, yes, it's very, very important. And whoever asked that question is asking the right one. I guess I'll, I'll just, oh, OTI, can you repeat it? Oh yeah, please chime in, chime in, yeah, chime in. Uh, my, my only comment was gonna be, again, going back to um, measuring and metrics. I think I've been on this train for a little while here. Um, and this really is, I'm sure, a very biased point of view for, for me, given where I came from, from a deeply technical background where I was so focused on measuring outcomes based on how accurate is my model, because that's what I'm thinking, of course. My cost function is, you know, optimizing for, and inevitably it's a proxy, a metric for what the business likely cares about. So the example from the session um, is really about if I'm trying to predict a specific outcome, then I will try to build a model that tries to predict whether or not that outcome will occur. How that then gets consumed can be extremely disconnected from what the business will actually do with it, because they are trying to take that prediction and turn it into an action. So earlier, next best action, what are they driving as an outcome? And monetization may be one of those items. So like how much more revenue can I get? Um, what can I actually try to add on to a deal? These are all options. But I, for, for me personally, at least from what I'm seeing is that the metric could be around that side. It could also be around other things. It could be around you know net promoter score. How are my customers feeling about these interactions? It could be about driving to closure uh, a case that's coming in. So it is about the business deciding what metric they are measuring and going against. It might just be that the easiest, splashiest way to talk about it, this dollars saved or dollars earned. But in reality, there are many different metrics that can be driven uh, down to like how happy an employee is with with you know what what they're doing at work. So now now that we looked at the past, the present, you stepped a little bit in the future. Um, questions to you guys is um, how what can we do today to wh wh whatever our level is to start heading in the right direction to welcome that wave of AI and ML. 
in very practical terms, very practical recipes, what would you advise all of us to do? I can take a, a first stab at that. Um, it is something that, something that we look at a lot. Um, and so five T's uh, to remember uh, in this. Uh, it's tasks, which we talked about, the separation of you know pe people and machine tasks. Talent, and so how do we fuse um, humans and technical skills? Um, uh, we talk uh, in our 21 Jobs of the Future, the, the coming role of the human machine teaming manager. And so that's something where we can get that, that optimal mix of talent uh, going right. The technology we've talked about, all right? So that's the third T, technology. Uh, how can we, again, uh, think about front, middle, back office processes to Dan's point, you know, sometimes there's, there's a lot of friction in those processes and it's not necessarily the technology just the way that the processes are set up and so application of technology across that uh teams is the fourth t so how do you set up your teams right um th there's been a lot made over um, uh, the last several years on the movement to agile for for technology driven teams i think the last year of lockdown we've we've explored the idea of how do we return to work what does hi a hybrid model look like do we do full-time all the time from re remotopia so that's an impact on teams and specifically for technology teams, the use of pods to be able to do that. And then the fifth and final one is trust. And I talked about it, right? The implications of trust and the use of these very powerful uh, tools. And so as a starting point, kind of running down that list of the five T's is a place to, to begin. And I think that, you know, we think about AI and ML, uh, it's as good a, a list as any. And for you, Sarah, I, I, would, I would be curious, you know, you at some point you started in AI, you probably were not born with all the alg algorithms in, in your mind. What were the first thing that for you were critical to become the data scientist you are today? For the data science side, I think I always lead with a, a need to just have curiosity and to also adopt really like a relentlessness <laughs> that goes alongside that. So I think on the curiosity front, I always give examples of, um, you know, there were areas that I was interested in, things that I wanted to explore. Uh, they ended up being, you know, looking at 3D images of worms, but really the goal was to try and understand, like, how could we label cells in an image? And I had no understanding of that field. Uh, in fact, I was not a big fan of lab work, but I was curious and I wanted to learn. The flip side is also to make sure that you know, when something comes in, I ask questions about like, how are the different ways that I can approach it? How can I collaborate with individuals? The relentlessness is really about, well, after I kind of explore that space and, and try to find different approaches, it's about learning about the data, learning about the business, asking the hard questions around like, why is my model performing so well? Is there a problem? Why is my model underperforming? How, you know, what are the maybe sub-segments? Why isn't out robust to certain types of data? And what's wonderful is that space I think as a result, going back to curiosity has become, how do we make that something more permanent? But within all of this, again, it's just the foundation of collaboration. So the opportunity that I had to work in these interdisciplinary fields in programs that were actually by design interdisciplinary, I think allowed me to pursue kind of both of those sides. So I can't believe it. You, you, you did not mention any uh, strange name of algorithm, not even Python or Hadoop. I mean, does it mean that the mere models like, like us all have a chance to, to grow into uh, like an AI driven job or close to that? I guess looping back to where I am now very much anchoring my mindset. Um, I think the tools are becoming more and more democratized. And, you know, to some level, the algorithms matter, but I think Again, shameless plug for the session. When we talk right here about the coolest applications of AI or where the future is headed, no one is talking about an algorithm. Yes, the algorithms are what is behind it. And yes, there are going to be some pockets of individuals that are talking about their research or something that they read and how it applies, though, to the business. I think this is where it really differentiates, for me at least, why I am in an industry setting. It's because it's about the application. And as we make these tools more and more available, it's about inspiring trust by you know, having these transparent ways of um, interrogating models or even tools that are being made available that make that second nature and natural. And so I would say, I mean, for me, the, the North Star is empowering people to not worry about the algorithms and instead worry about the, the metrics that they're tracking and how those are moving as a result of the application of those Algorithms that, you know, the way we focus, we almost abstract them away to you. All right. And how about you, Dan? Come on, give us some 
technical sound bites because there has to be a little bit of techy stuff we got to learn somewhere. What would that be? I could say forests. No, uh, just joking. <laughs> uh, um, somebody had to say it, so I said it. Uh, but but I have to say that uh, listening to to Rob and Sarah, I, I and although I'm focusing at, at large companies in the last few years, um, I, I I've been working many years. Uh, of my life primarily with startups. And what I've seen, um, to Sarah's point, I've seen a company with about three and a half people. All the, that was the size of the company. Uh, perhaps a CEO that is a product person or business person originally, and a CTO, CIO, R&D manager that is a technical person and some, and, and, uh, some operational person. And even so, such a small company, it's also very segmented. Either, either we're talking about algorithms and, 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 and um, how we're going to apply it into data, that's a technical guy. Or we talk, we talk about, so I always fail to understand how can you uh, do your job as a company that needs to generate value to a customer if you escape from talking about this in one room? Um, so that is the point. I, 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 what Sarah said is exactly the point. The point is that um, talking about algorithms is important once you sit in this, uh, once the technical person understands why they're doing this. If you don't understand why you, what are you applying the algorithm for, and all you see is a set of data, then your chances um, not to 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 generate to generate a great algorithm or a great insight from data, but not to contribute to the customer is very high, and vice versa. If you are a salesperson, and every time somebody says cloud, or an or or an algorithm, you escape to the to the other room. Um, that doesn't make sense because to generate value, we need to understand what building blocks we want to use. I, and there's no, no, no need to, re, to repeat uh, the entire story here. So I think that going back to leaders, I think each of us leads itself, is in, uh, ourselves and our time that first of all, we need to be liable for ourselves and then business leaders have, have um, the overall uh, responsibility to be in the room and to have a discussion. And that's much harder than it sounds, but I think that's the, the point we, we're trying to make here. Yes, and it's, you know, it's not up to the panelists to voice comments, but here I cannot help saying that, uh, well, I completely agree. This is where we see the biggest gaps in organization, what you all described. And what sometimes makes me sad or frustrated is that um, all the rest, the technical piece, we can all practice it at different levels. I personally, teach it, it's, there are for everyone things that you can learn and master, that is not the issue. What Sarah, Rob and Dan just described is probably where you need to dig deep inside to get your superpowers out. As human beings, we all have them, we just need to find a way to get to them because on the technical side, you can learn. That's something that Berkeley Global does that we do at Fisher Center, we can take you there. And Gutier, maybe I can say uh, you you had a great story about one of your classes where you you were teaching data analytics, and you have given the the some of their uh, answers or algorithms to the people just to make sure that they start and end the project and see what's the what's the process that data goes from from the beginning to the end. So uh, I thought that was a great uh, story. Uh, when reaching out to the to, to see how uh, what's the process, what's the um, life cycle of data analytics looks like is more important than really master all the, the pieces of it. Yeah, th exactly. That's that's what matters in the end, and I see that every day with students. So talking about so we know what to do. Are there things that we should not do? These lures and mirages I mentioned at the very beginning of this panel. Are there any like stop sign, you know, don't enter here signs you would put up to say, guys, don't go there. You're gonna be misled. What are some warnings you would issue? 
a few things that I always uh, <laughs> I always want to warn everyone for upfront is don't believe that when you ship a model you're done. Like always plan for that iteration, always. Another is don't focus on accuracy, focus on business metrics. At the end of the day, no one is going to reward you or promote you because you have an accurate model that rewards you or promote you because of what you've been able to deliver for your business. And I think every time we enter into these conversations, having both of those perspectives from day one, which is what does the MVP look like? How do we put process and tools and platforms in place, whatever you choose to make it possible to think about iteration? We, we don't need to spend all of our time ser searching for the perfect model because that is a fallacy. Everything is iterative. Everything will need to be renewed. There are gonna be unexpected changes like what just happened over the last year where data shapes even shifted and who could have anticipated that? Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, those two really make sure that you plan for iteration. And on the other front, it's just um, supporting that along the way. One of the most poignant things that I have heard in the last few years uh, came at a, a dinner with a um, CEO of a very large Silicon Valley tech company who um, asserted that there will be no place in the future of work for philosophers. And as an American, um, I couldn't disagree with that more. Um, and I think that, you know, Gautier, the premise of your question is there are things that we should be careful about in these tech use of, of these very cutting edge technologies. Absolutely. Uh, for anybody who's, you know, read the book 1984, it's almost a cliche at this point, but because we have these very powerful technologies, should we always be using these technologies? And that's a question that we need to answer for ourselves as a society. Uh, we are a liberal democracy in America. Uh, we come in all shapes, colors, sizes, and it's important for the health of that liberal democracy for people to participate in the building of these powerful tools, these algorithms, these tools of automation. And so I think that Silicon Valley has learned that lesson uh, in some ways painfully uh, over the last uh, number of years. I think that the tech is getting better. It's certainly not where it, it needs to be, but that inclusion principle is, is very important. Again, in 21 Jobs of the Future, one of the roles that we imagined, uh, you know, you could, you could potentially see statutes that mandate either, you know, out of Europe, the United States, uh, algorithm bias. You know, how do you ascertain that your algorithm is not biased before it's being applied? You're seeing municipalities across the across the country that are saying, you know, no facial recognition cameras. We've had a year of racial uh, reckoning in this country. So all of that is why I think to sum this up, a university like Berkeley in asking these questions with a mission of public policy and looking at this through sort of the galvanizing prism of the future of work, which includes, yes, electrical engineering, computer science, econ, right, business, but also things like the humanities uh, and other disciplines, biology. You can cut across that entire discipline of what a university is meant to do as a vehicle for us as uh, a society. And that's why it's important. So let's be mindful of the power of these things. And before, uh, while there's still time, let's make sure we're putting in some guardrails and stop signs where they're necessary. Yeah, and I will just overlap uh, on the on the uh, fact that uh, the human factor is not the operator of uh, machine learning or any data-driven systems. Um, it's part of them. So you have a part of any any uh, AI systems or data-driven systems are um, the machines, the algorithms, the technologies the connections, the integrations, the ingestion of data, the output of data, but it's also people that are part of the process. So once you look at humans as the operator, in many cases, it's, it's doomed to fail. And if not in the beginning, then it when becomes more complex. You have to ask yourself, who is the sponsor of their overall process that I'm trying to build? and or sponsors and how I work with the sponsor that owns the process on two prongs. One is to understand the human uh, part of the, in the entire process, the human AI side, and then how we look at this as human in the input and the output and, and make sure that uh, we improve on all the technical parts as, as, as we go. 
Um, if these two, two uh, thinking processes are not in, then it's just a bunch of technologies uh, being stuck together. Right. Well, thank, thank you. So we reached the, the end of the more structured panel. We have a lot of questions. One is um, probably towards Sarah, you alluded a bit to it. Um, where do you see, or maybe Dan, or maybe all of you, where do you see AI going directly for a consumer? And I think it means you see AI in the hands of consumers. If, if the question was to me, uh, apologies. I think, I mean, in, in my mind, if it's about consuming or interacting with AI, I think we do this daily and probably don't even realize it, but yeah. uh, speech recognition, um, recommended replies in our emails or you know, surfacing important messages to us. These are already the way that AI is manifesting itself to consumers every single day in ways that are just convenient for us that just make our lives easier. And we probably don't even process it as being AI. I and mean, if we go all the way back, like really your navigation system on your car was even doing that and updating it then with, yeah. you know, how long will it take uh, given historical traffic patterns now is the update of it where it's just the convenience where it's already in the hand of consumers. And also in just such a powerful way to let you play with it and ask questions of it, interrogate it, which is building that trust and understanding where yes, we, we believe that the model has done something valuable, but we can even ask it questions to confirm that it is doing what we need. Um, I, I'll just jump in. There's a, a number of kind of related questions to uh, uh, around the, the requirement to have experience in AI to start to start uh, earning experience in AI. Um, I think where we look at this is in in uh, upskilling and reskilling, and there's application of, of, of AI across many many different fields. And again, our 21 jobs of the future is sort of a you know a way of of looking at how the application of AI may may come about. And so one thing that's incumbent, I think, upon all participants, um, uh, businesses, societies, um, uh, you know, the uh, governments. Uh, trade organizations is how do we start to upskill people in using uh, these tools? And so there's a lot of different ways to think about that. You know, if you imagine like LinkedIn today, you know, you're in a certain role, you feel like it's a dead end job. What's the stepstone path to get from here to there? And what are um, the use of things like, you know, Berkeley Global, for example, or other, you know, massively online open courses to help you in a matter of uh, weeks or months to get those skills. And so one of the areas that I'm going to be looking a lot at is the role of micro credentialing in things like AI, uh, uh, data science, and so forth, and other disciplines to be able to use these new technologies and make the jump without sa saying, well, geez, I got to step out of, of work for you know two years or four years and go get another degree. That's just not practical. And so I think that, that it's that skills gap that we're going to need to be looking at and how we can use uh, learning models uh, to help us bridge that. So while you guys select a question, I see a question from uh, Mihaela. Actually, Mihaela used, uh, is, used to be a student of mine like many years ago, and it's amazing to see uh, uh, this community of uh, data-driven student that went on that, that path. It's always great to see that uh, seeds you planted, you know, are, are, have, uh, have grown. Um, it's, um, it's a rather technical topic about reducing bias in data sets. Any good directions, good practice, in a heartbeat, you could uh, you could share because this is obviously a, a lot of the sources of bias in in, uh, in AI the data sets. Yeah, I, I think um, so. There, bias is a very loaded term because again, also manifests itself in data. I, I'm assuming this one is on the ethical front as well. Um, I think there are a lot of tools out there that help us understand and, and publications addressing this field around. Um, how to identify, first of all, bias. Um, I'm, I know I personally am very interested in, you know, the topic of model robustness. Um, I feel like I'm also, we have, a, you know, someone that leads an ethical practice in AI here at Salesforce, Kathy Baxter. And I think what's really important is also the process around making sure that even at the inception, uh, the way it was mentioned earlier, we think about the possible unintended consequences of putting models out there and um, having, uh, there's so many examples uh, dating all the way back to, uh, there, there's this very famous example about like seat belts. And I don't know whether or not it's true, but certainly been used a lot uh, that they were designed. Um, and when seat belts were put out into the market, they found a lot of injuries for children and women 
because the folks that were designing it were also testing it on themselves happened to be males of a certain stature. And so it's when you do not have diverse individuals thinking about like <laughs> building these products where your actual community that you're serving is diverse, you will have a lot of errors. I think you think even about, you know, if you, if you train only, I have this example on like English data sets, then you put something out in the wild. Well, of course, you're not only going to have English language in there. And so there are tools out there to really explore. Uh, and there are also, I think on my team, this at the outset, thinking through the scenarios, thinking through test cases and really bringing a diverse set of individuals to the table so that we can look forward um, even from the beginning on how to not fall into these traps and do a great job of serving the community and not ending with these unintended consequences. Quick hi to uh, my, my fellow translators who do help us on many projects translating. They would say when you work with real English, not the, <laughs> the other one. As a Swiss, we have that problem with Swiss German and real German. <laughs> I've got, I got one that I love from Cindy, who also I know uh, uh, from from classes, um, okay, that's that's a tough one because they're probably you know leaders among ourselves and uh, and uh, that that look at this and say, where do I start? I mean, uh, I'm a leader. Should I get too technical? Um, how do I uh, uh, prioritize uh, my 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 strategy to take care of AI? It's easy to like all or nothing. I mean. I guess, you know, it's still a problem out there, but are there any uh, advice you could deliver to leaders to make that happen? Not in the way that pretty, pretty much happened, like in the past 10 years where everybody was gung ho and a lot of companies failed. What's can, the... I can comment uh, on that. So first of all, if you're watching this, uh, you may be on the right track. Uh, <laughs> um, I think that um, the best point I can, or, or thought I can share is, that you need to, to, uh, to um, do something technical with your own hands, even if you never did, even if a technical and it definitely um, AI or in any, any other uh, terms are intimidating and you don't know where to begin, this is exactly the point to figure out. Uh, you need to get your hands dirty you need to take a data set. You need to understand what is this data set? Who cares about this data set? Why this data set even, even uh, exist? Do something on it. Understand that maybe what you thought about the data set is not even true. <laughs> and start all over again. Getting your hands dirty, being a user of something is the only way I know how to understand um, um, the point and to be part of conversation. And I think that, again, seriously, I think that um, the work that uh, uh, you do, Gutierrez, and the, and the great Berkeley team is doing is exactly um, a, a rare opportunity to start going that route and, and build your, your capabilities, even if it's not comfortable. Come, come to workshops with us. We have great hands-on moments where you could see all this happening actually yeah <laughs> i think another thing that's worth pointing out in that context too and you know like the the the, the 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 do it taste it try it see the power of the technologies is the adjacencies of, of different technologies i think what we're going to see very quickly is we talked a bit about the the power of um of uh uh voice interfaces voice ux uh, the, there is a, an exploding world now, the onset of AR and VR technologies in, um, in immersive worlds of just the presentment of, you know, it's, it's a weird term, but you know, avatar technology, where there is a presentment of somebody who is not necessarily yourself. And if you start moving together AI technologies like GPT-3, together with voice recognition technologies, and so the appearance in immersive space, um, there are some really powerful tools that can kind of come together and create new jobs, new businesses, new experiences of the future, but also some new pitfalls uh, to my previous points that we need to need to look out for. Uh, in a very rote way, going back to the data part of this discussion with the AI and data, the interplay, how do you even get to the right data set? Um, there's a lot of just really 
bog standard technologies that have been around for a while, like, like robotic process automation technologies, like RPA. How do you bridge together two different compute, you know, computing platforms to get to the right data? And then you can build out of that rote and repetitive stuff to the really cool application of using that data, as Sarah said, into some really cool AI uh, technologies. So there's a number of different, you know, sort of pots of technology that will allow people to Dan's point to, you know, get stuck in try it. We found in our work, you know, Cognizant is 300,000 people globally, some of the most resistant people to change and as is processes. Once they saw the technology got stuck in, it's like they become so, they became some of the most powerful advocates to say, wow, we could really stop doing this in a stupid way and a, a, approach it from a completely different perspective and rebuild that process for tomorrow. And Sarah, you had, a, you had a take on that? Yeah, I just, I, I love both of these answers are so, they're just like, ding, ding, ding. <laughs> First of all, what Dan said about, you know, you, the things that you don't believe about your data, and then someone comes in and tells you, Tenvir called himself a data science salesman. Back in the day, I used to view myself as um, a data psychologist. I was helping the data find its voice to like tell you, like, this is what's in it because everyone mm. has assumptions. It's like, no, no, like, let's look at your data. The number of times that I think we went to the business and we said, we found X and they're, they're just like, that's not true. And you pull up the results the, where the model said, this is driving, you know, the, the predictiveness of the model, like it's, it's right there in your face and they need to sort of learn it. So I just, when I heard that, I had to laugh. <laughs> but then what, what Rob is saying, really, it's, it's exactly right, which is the business is not going to buy into most of this until they're actually able to see the value. Again, like going back to if we're always talking about algorithms and the technology and like what it is and, you know, maybe even how complex it is to get to it, we lose. From, from day one, we have lost that argument because asking for something to be funded because you can predict or can is not going to work. But finding that business stakeholder that wants to see the value and is willing to, again, measure the impact. They're willing to say this, the hours we saved, you know, the, the NPS that has gone up, the way the employees view their data experience and how they're able to close cases faster. Those are the things that you can measure. And that's where the business can come and educate themselves, like everyone said, with these sessions, understand the value that has happened before and start thinking about how it could work within their business, but squarely focused on. It's always like for me, business value and level of effort. Make sure that you can put it on the value axis. If you can't measure it, nobody cares. And value is not the accuracy. Value is literally what it does for your business and working at it that way. Oh, thank you, guys. Well, just one last point um, about uh, diversity and inclusion in, in this field. I mean, at uh, Berkeley, the Fisher Center for Business Analytics and with the support of Berkeley Global, we run the foundation, uh, the Alliance for Inclusive AI, which actually delivers entirely free training certificate uh, to women and representative of minorities or underprivileged communities. So we do deliver world class, class training to these trainees who didn't get the luck to be on the right train, on the right track or with the right uh, mentors to get there. So, um, I, I was going to ask, do you see diversity improving? Do you see um, uh, initiatives that are dear to you, close to you, helping in that way? I would say, I mean, I'll just start from a cognizant perspective. Um, we're getting, getting much, much better. It's been a huge focus for us as a business. Um, gender parity. Uh, and gender inclusion has been a big part of it. Um, uh, racial inclusion and diversity has been really uh, important for us as a, a part of our business. Um, we're getting better. We're, we're, we're not where we want to be, but it's a process of, of perfectibility. I think our association with you guys, uh, the AI, uh, AI AI initiative is a part of that. Cognizance Women Empowered initiative is a part of that. We have a strong diversity and inclusion um, thrust that I think you're seeing with a lot of Silicon Valley companies now. It's been a little too late in coming, but we're getting better, but there's a lot of work to do. And I think as a future of work focus, um, that's a part of it. And so um, uh, ever onward, I think, is, is the important part of that. It's important for us as a company. It's an important part uh, for us as technologists and certainly as a society as well. I think uh, from a Salesforce standpoint, there's lots out there about all the work that is being done and, and the focus around it. 
And I just always want to bring it back to my earlier point where it isn't only about the notion of equality being important uh, for, for kind of an equity standpoint. It's really, it makes our products better when the folks that are building the product look like the world around you. That is how you can ensure that you are really representing all of the opportunity for how to best serve each other, how to best move us all forward together. And so it, to me, it's so, so critical for us not to, to take it from a standpoint of it's a mandate, which I think, it, yeah, there's Silicon Valley is moving forward with that mindset. But I think there's also just what I'm so passionate about is hearing that growing chorus of it is, it is the right thing to do for everyone, for the stakeholders, for the evidence that we have about how businesses operate when they have diverse members, diverse leaders, and the difference that it makes for us in, in terms of delivering what's right. Not much to add here. Uh, in, in all my career as a, as, as a manager, diverse teams is what we want uh, to create. That's what makes the product, just like Rob and Sarah just said, the products, the customer service, the success um, is only possible if there is diverse human rep representation. That's not an obligation. This is a privilege and what and an and obligation to um, 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 to um, to make a reality if it's not reality. Um, and it's just mirrored to everything we talked about data and 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 uh, and data driven machines. If if the if the teams are diverse, if there are representations of different cultures, of different thinking, of different angles, then your products and your processes naturally will will grow uh, to to be the best they can. If the teams are not diverse, I don't see how you have a chance to uh, to be what you can be as a company, as society, and as as a, as a product. Thank you, thank you so much, guys. On these uh, to to end up on these terms, I would love to change my background because this is how I felt all along, like a kid in in a candy store. <laughs> <laughs> um, I don't know if the audience um, enjoyed as much as, as I did listening to you. I, I know you guys, I know your content, but each time I listen to you, I learn more things. So it's almost time to, uh, you know, to, go, to go away. Um, Sarah, Rob, and Dan, any parting thoughts and maybe one teasing sentence about what our viewers are going to discover in your expert seminar classes? I'll go, I'll go first. Um, uh, my parting words is uh, uh, future of work is always in the future, but it starts tomorrow. That's sort of the motto that we use in, in our team that, you know, that's never, never too late. Grab that opportunity. Um, thank you for, uh, for joining today. My, again, shameless plug. Um, my lecture is on the work ahead in M uh, AI and ML. Uh, building our next new future of work after the virus. And you have an amazing guest from Pepsi Cola. That's, Absolutely. Uh... I, can, I, I can just, if you don't mind, uh, uh, quickly say that um, uh, my session is about, we call it the business, business AI. And um, um, I tried uh, to focus in triggering uh, the people that are... Um, non-technical -te people to um, to be not not to do something but to be excited about about uh, uh, making the, the step but also to um, to the technological engineering oriented people that uh, have been spending so much time in developing these great technologies uh, to trigger that part of the house to understand more about the uh, about what, uh, wh why are we doing this and how we're doing this and diversity, by the way, is, is being enabled by being connected to both ends and not being siloed. Um, so um, I'm honored to be part of it. Thank you very much the Berkeley team to, for the invite and um, happy to be, uh, to follow up and be in touch uh, with our audience. Thank you. Right, I guess I do need to end. Well, up here we'll go <laughs> once more, but um, yeah. Same shameless plug for my session. Um, I, I really want to focus around the notion of putting 
AI into the hands of customers, business experts, and democratizing these capabilities. Because I truly believe that the future of how we will move forward is to, to be part of an organization that is enabling. Um, and the session really focuses around, of course, all the foundational layers, even if you are building AI yourselves, how do you make sure that when you are building that out, you have all of those enabling capabilities and you're thinking through the iteration and focusing on business value and how to deliver it and making sure that there's that collaboration around the way that facilitates it. So yeah, the closing remarks is for me, it really is about democratization and, and enabling business value and everything that we deliver here with AI. Well, thank you so much, guys. I'll finish also with a shameless plug for you guys. I will be your first student registering for your sessions. There's so much I can review and we learn. And I hope you guys uh, well, on the other side of the screen really felt the same way. I really look forward to seeing you taking that class. And um, well, hopefully we'll stay in touch. Thank you very much to Nadej and Frederic at the Berkeley Global team for giving us the opportunity to develop this content, to put it together and to make it available to you know, a global community. Have a safe data journey, guys, and hopefully We'll meet again.